We are fortunate enough to be joined by Jared Montez Slack, who is the Senior Director of Relationships and Giving at I Live Here, I Give Here, uh, which is a Central Texas nonprofit known for hosting Amplify Austin Day. If you're from the Austin area, I'm sure you're familiar, uh, which is a community-wide giving event that raises over $10 million annually. Um, Jared joined I Live Here, I Give Year in 2023 and works directly with local companies to execute their impact strategies, both in employee-engaged volunteerism and collective giving. Outside of work, Jared is an avid uh, Austin FC supporter, enjoys baking, volunteers with local theaters, and builds tiny homes uh, alongside a local nonprofit. So we're super excited uh, to have Jared here to kind of give that perspective of, of somebody who's in your shoes working, you know, with the nonprofit community. Um, so Jared, really appreciate you being here. And he's joined by one of Bonterra's very own Annie Hornland, who is a solutions architect here at Bonterra, who I will call our, our CSR expert for the day. Um, Annie has been a solutions architect here at Bonterra in the CSR space since 2022, um, but she's also worked in uh, financial technology, payroll, banking, cancer research, commercialization, and um, has really kind of honed in on the CSR space now here at Bonterra. Uh, she does a lot of our CSR webinars specifically. So if you happen to attend both, you're probably familiar with Annie and know that she is uh, a bundle of knowledge. So super excited to bring you kind of both perspectives here today. So thank you both for joining us. I will stop talking now because you're probably all sick of hearing from me. Um, and I will uh, let y'all take it away and, and let the stars of the show um, drop some wisdom on you. Ha, dropping wisdom. I love that. Thank you for the setup, Amanda. I'm just so grateful to be here with you guys. Uh, it's been wonderful getting to prepare for this uh, this workshop with you all. And I'm really excited to get to present, especially, you know, I work a lot here in Central Texas. So seeing all these places from all over, uh, it just feels really good to to know that like, no matter where we are in this beautiful country of ours, we're kind of all in this together. So I'm really excited to talk with you guys today about best practices for corporate engagement. Um, so like Amanda said, I'm with, uh, I live here, I give here in Austin, Texas. We are, an, you know, like I said, nonprofit, just like you guys. Um, we're here to inspire giving and more community engagement here in Central Texas. And one of the drivers behind that is we do host an annual giving day called Amplify Austin Day. But then throughout the year, uh, a lot of my work is helping to, to build better bridges between our local business community and it's Austin. So we have global companies that are represented here, but they have massive footprints in our community. So how can I work with our local business community and all of the resources and opportunities that exist there? And how can I drive and build better relationships with our local nonprofits? And I think many of you are sitting in the seat as a person working at a nonprofit, just saying like, please help us because these companies are hard to break into. We don't really know what they want. Um, and I'm telling you right now, like I know what that feels like uh, being a person who's worked in uh, development and fundraising for years. This is the first job that I've had as a development person where the predominant avenue for us as a nonprofit to raise funding is through corporations. It's different than working with donors. I'm sure some of you are sitting at your computers right now, just nodding your head up and down like, oh my gosh, it's so different. It's so different. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the reality that building relationships with corporations is just different than working with donors. Their motivations and their mechanisms are just, they're just simply not the same. And kind of how we got started the key to all of this really is in the in the letters CSR, and many of you know this already. It stands for Corporate Social Responsibility, and right here really is the most fundamental thing to understand about this work. You are dealing with responsibility, and understand this. Companies cannot be responsible for everything. As much as I want Google to change the world and save everything and make everything better because they're sitting on a pile of cash or whatever corporation I can name that is making so much money, it's impossible for a corporation or company to feel a sense of responsibility to every single cause or issue that exists in the world. They're going to have to choose what they want to be responsible for. So that's how we have the development of corporate social responsibility programs for companies is because they're identifying the things they feel a sense of responsibility to. 
And so the key to understanding your approach to these companies is to understand and get a feeling for what they feel responsible for and to, and how that sense of responsibility can align with your mission and the thing that your organization has a responsibility towards. So that's really where you begin. You begin by understanding these key differences between corporations and individuals and really understanding those key differences. Differences come from the realm of understanding their, under, their responsibilities and how they approach that. So first difference, this is just motivations. And I'm gonna be straight with you. I'm from a small town in East Texas. I keep this stuff simple. Um, and so we're gonna keep this workshop very simple as far as thinking through these differences. So you have differences in motivations. Pursuing relationships with corporations is different than working with donors because their motivations, they're just not the same. Corporations often engage with in partnerships as part of their corporate social responsibility strategies. Their motivations include so many different things, right? It could be brand reputation. It could be fulfilling these CSR commitments that they put in the board meeting from two years ago. They said that they were going to do, so they're just trying to chase that. It could be that they're trying to engage their employees in something. You know, a big thing that we know that happens um, for companies is this notion of how do we retain, how do we keep the best and the brightest at our companies? And so many times a motivating factor for corporations when it comes to engaging with your nonprofit is whether or not it's going to make their employees happy. That's a very oversimplification of it. But like, what are the things that your nonprofit offers towards this company that hits at these motivations. They've got business goals. They've got things that they want to achieve and that is to be a profitable company. So you see how that kind of might actually go against the grain of what you're seeking. This company that's seeking to make money, you're trying to get them to give you some of it. You have to understand the motivations are just so different. Um, they seek partnerships that provide a measurable and conveyable impact. What I mean by that is, they want impact from your organization that they can then tell the story to their stakeholders. That's the motivation. The impact doesn't, the impact story does not stop with the company. The company is a conduit for that impact story. Oftentimes working with donors, that impact story is for the donor. Yes, they may go tell friends and, and, and persons they know in their sphere of influence. And yes, you want that, but it's not a natural driver necessarily. It's a natural driver for the corporation to want a measurable impact that they can then go tell their own story alongside. Know that going in. Um, and really the best example here is, and it's kind of a dark example, but think Exxon, right? Like there are different motivations for all of this. When you think about how a company interacts with nonprofits, the story as to why can be so complex. I won't go into any specifics, but I know of, and this is not here in Austin, Texas, it's somewhere else in the universe. I will go into no specifics, but like there's companies that are doing things in spaces as long as far as philanthropy. But if you dig in five years ago, that owner of that company made some comment that really ignited some anger and rage around an issue. And so now that company is trying to dig their way out of that problem they created by focusing CSR in the area. So again, understanding those motivations. I'll quickly go through this. Donors, donors are typically motivated by personal passion. This is storytelling. This is friend making. This is just walking alongside an individual. You're creating a, a, an emotional connection to the cause. Um, people are desiring to make a difference. And that's not to say companies don't want to make a difference. It's, I'm just saying it's different, right? Um, for the individual donor, their decisions are often driven by emotional connections. Maybe there's an underlying story. Maybe the person you know, experienced food insecurity as a child, or maybe they went to school with someone who did. Oftentimes you see those motivations are really driven by a deeply internalized story that that donor is experiencing. And again, companies aren't people as much as some might try to push that narrative. Companies are not people. They don't have emotions. They're not driven by those internal things like that. It's just different. Um, some individual donors may seek recognition. You know, you'll meet that donor that's like, give me a building and I want to talk about how big my name's going to be on outside of it. Yes, some donors are going to be like that. But then there are donors who are like, no, nah, I just like to give and I don't want anybody to know because this is just about me. This is just about me making a decision. So it's different motivating factors. Second, different mechanisms. This is a toughie, right? 
because what you begin to find out that like working with corporations, the decision-making process is so differently structured. Uh, in corporations, it's, it's much more longer timelines. There's multiple stakeholders involved. You got to know who's the marketing director. You need to know who the key decision maker is. You may be talking to the marketing person. You're probably going to end up sending an invoice to the accounting team. So you're going to have multiple contacts towards the company. Um, a lot of stakeholders, you could have a CSR department involved, you could have executives, all those things. Employee resource groups also get involved. Uh, those the ERG groups, they get involved in these conversations sometime, depending on the company. Um, but typically, these, these decisions are made with multiple stakeholders, and it's really driven by strategic alignment. Whether or not all of these individual players feel a sense of, yeah, this is what we as a group are wanting to do. So a lot of different mechanisms and a lot of different levers to pull. Also, this is just something to know. When you work with companies, guess what? People get new jobs. So what happens sometimes with companies, the mechanisms are much more difficult because it's, hey, I've been talking to John Smith for the past six months. And then you email John Smith on a Tuesday and you get that automatic email back saying John Smith no longer works there. And so then you're kind of like, well, I got to find my new John at the next, at that same company. So who's taking John's place? A lot of different mechanisms. Donors, kind of the opposite more direct process. Typically you're working with the person who's gonna write the check or maybe one person removed from the person who's gonna write the check. Way fewer stakeholders. Typically it's family oriented or more closer knit persons. Um, simpler decision-making process. Does it feel right? Is the money right? Do we have this? Great. Really about personal alignment. Oftentimes with donors, the, the mechanism for receiving the financial contribution, so much more simple, right? So just understanding that working with corporations, working with donors, different mechanisms, different um, kind of like fundamental structures and understandings you need to have under it. Third, this is kind of getting to the mechanism aspect of it. They have different ways of wanting to engage. Corporations are seeking more robust and formal agreements. A lot more, if we do this, you're going to do this. A lot more like in the realm of corporation CSR work, you're going to deal with the reality of deliverables, things like that. Whenever you're talking about these partnership avenues, there could be multiple avenues by which they work with you. So a lot of times with donors, it's more direct, it's less formalized. You know, maybe that donor is wanting to give to your capital campaign, super simple. Maybe that donor is wanting to give to your, you know, capacity building, and they're much more keen on paying for operations. Donors are a lot easier to work with on operational monies, covering your fees for like fundraisers and all that kind of stuff. Corporations aren't nearly as keen to cover your operational expenses. They want more um, specialized projects. What are things we can do together that have a finite time to them, a beginning, an end, a final product, a deliverable that says this is the project we started and this is the project we created. Yes, those are things that you will absolutely do with your donors. But again, so much less formalized. You know, like I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, my relationship building with donors is sending a text message. My relationship building with corporations is newsletters, formalized things, setting calendar dates. When are we going to get coffee? When am I going to stop at your office? When are we going to hop on a Google call? Donors, so much more informal and so much more just kind of like dating in a weird way. Dating, friendship building, just human to human contact. Um, and then donors, they really want to, they're more flexible with these interactions. They can come by and see you on a Tuesday. They can just pop over. You can have much more flexibility with them. And then these donors get to see their contributions at work. I'll go back to the corporation part of it too. A big uh, difference here is engagement opportunities for the employees. Yes, you're gonna have donors, individual humans who are like, yeah, I'm gonna give to your organization and I'm gonna go online and find some places for myself to volunteer. Really that's the donor taking the initiative to find those spots. And yes, maybe you work with them to like help them identify the right place to volunteer, in corporations, they may say, we want to give you money, but we want to see 25 persons coming to volunteer every quarter with your nonprofit organization. 
which we'll get to that, that kind of opens up a can of worms, right? Like what if it's a corporation that you're wanting to engage around CSR and then they're saying like, hey, we would really like to see 25 volunteers at your organization once a quarter. Well, the challenge becomes, what if your nonprofit doesn't have a physical location? What if your nonprofit works with a protected population? Or what if it's just not cool to have a bunch of, you know, white collar business persons show up at your community holding some, you know, um, food insecure children? Like, these are hard things that you have to think through and think about those engagements because a lot of time the corporation is going to want that. And to the point, right, like, this is why we see some of the, I call them the big dogs, these big dog order organizations with really wonderful and complex volunteer programs. This is why you see them being so successful in the corporate space because they are agile and able to make it work for these engagement needs for these corporations. So just think that, know that going in. Um, different, different desires here. Expectations, you know, you've heard the phrase, it's not, it's not personal, it's just business. In many ways, working with philanthropy and corporations, like you have to remember, it is business. Yes, it's personal. Making the world better is personal. Philanthropy is personal. It's people love. So it is a personal thing, but at the end of the day, it is still a business decision on this corporation to support you. Corporations expect a certain level of expertise and professionalism in the relationship. So we're talking about reporting that looks professional. Um, we're talking about measurable results that feel a sense of professionalism. We're talking about creating agreements and documentation that feels professional, that feels like something that's substantial, that can be saved in files, that, that these corporations are used to working with. They're used to having formalized agreements. They're used to having these kinds of metrics and all these things. Also, the expectation of the corporations, they're really seeking some community visibility, right? Like they want to be seen in the community for what they are contributing outside of the product that they're presenting. They want to be shown as a valuable contributor to the community that they're in. And so in many ways, the expectation that they're bringing to you as a nonprofit is the hope that through your nonprofit, there's more visibility that comes and there's a more ability for that company to really showcase who they actually are. Donors are different. They value transparency and not formality. They want it to be really personal, deeply personal. So like, that's why would, if we were a different workshop talking about working with donors, we'd be talking about how do you personalize your communications? How do you personalize those engagements? How do you personalize everything? It's going to be talking about personalized, 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 over and over and over and over and over. That's the difference. The expectation is professional versus personal. And so with the business relationship, yes, it has to be personal, but it's going to feel more professional. With the donor relationship, it's going to feel more personal, but it's going to need to be professional too, Right. And so it's just different expectations. It's like yin and yang, different emphasis, but the same coin. Um, and then also too for donors. And I would say this is with corporations too, but you're going to have to think about it. It's more narrative and relational focused. I do great work with some of my contacts at corporations because like, say I am working with the CSR director for a company. I am building a relationship with that person as an individual. I am focusing on the narrative of that relationship. I am really focusing on what me and that person are working on together. So like learning things about like, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? How about them cowboys kind of conversations? But that's all part of, I know, sorry, I just, that's what we do down here. Um, <laughs> but you know, like. Jared, Jared, I'm a Giants fan. You can't, you uh, can't be bringing that into my webinars here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh man. Um, I really love actually soccer the biggest. So that's why I would get really passionate. Um, but so, but there's just differences, right? You just have to be mindful of that. Okay. So let's look at some key practices for corporate engagement. And again, I'm keeping this stuff as simple as possible for us. And that's really for my own benefit, right? So the first step, the first practice, and I say practice because practice is about daily. This is about who we are. This is about how we act. And so a practice of your organization is must always have the practice of having a mission that connects. And so when you think about corporations in particular, the practice of having a mission that connects is always having that mission as a horizon point. 
A clear mission statement provides stability and a focal point for the relationships that you're going to build. Okay, and that's important because when you think about identifying what that R in the CSR means for that company, when you identify it, what that responsibility that that company feels, that's how you can begin to understand, does my mission that operates as a horizon point for my organization, can this also operate as a horizon point for the responsibility narrative that this company has? So let's use X Exxon, for example. So like we we're going to see a lot about Exxon because of, you know, back in the 90s, early 2000s, they kept dumping oil into our water sources. Right. And so they've always had to now be on this posture of being environmentally friendly forward. Right. And so their mission isn't to make the world uh, less dependent on oil. Right. But they also have a horizon point as a company that they've identified that they must feel a sense of responsibility to the world that they are operating in. And so if you think about that from your place as a nonprofit, it doesn't mean you have to be an environmental nonprofit. It just means you have to find some sense of horizon point within this responsibility that Exxon feels. You can think about that with any company, banking, financial institutions. Financial, ins financial institutions have horizon points for what they feel responsible for, but your missions can fit in to those responsibility points, even if it's not like super like we do financial education. And so that's why your bank should give us money, but it could be different spaces. Um, and so what I mean by that is when you think about building those relationships with corporations, when you have that clear alignment, when you're able to say, here's my mission, and I have done the work to help you see how my mission can be a horizon point for your business values and your business goals you're giving them an ability to see how this can benefit what they're already working towards. And so what I say to that is you have to be prepared to point out and elaborate on how the mission of the company aligns with the mission of your organization and show that you have an understanding of their values and goals. Because you're always trying to come at it from the space of mutual benefit, mutual benefit, mutual benefit. And donor work, it's not necessarily about mutual benefit. Yes, I could go to the donor. I used to work for an organization that worked with persons experiencing homelessness. So sometimes, I'm, sometimes I would talk to the donor and say, like, listen, like, this is kind of for your own benefit, right? Like, give money towards an organization that is trying to do something about the crisis of housing here in my community. And if you do something about it, it actually makes your living experience better, right? So I could come at it from the angle of, yes, give to us. And long term, you are doing this for your own good because you are improving the world around you. But with businesses, you can go direct. I know what your values are. I know what your goals are. I know the community of persons you're hoping to get business from. And that community cares about my mission. And you can bring alignment in that. Practice two, a co-creator approach. Um, I think this is just some uh, mumbo jumbo that I really like to say because I really like co-creator approaches to things and I'm a naturally curious person. And I think that that plays a really key role in your success working with corporations. The best thing you can do for yourself is be a curious collaborator. Ask questions about their goals, get to know them. What are they trying to achieve in the community? What do they want to come from this? Yes, the answer can be, yeah, we just want to make the world better through your nonprofit. Cool. That's the nice, put a little bow on it answer, but there's also ulterior motives. This person has a job in this corporation because, and this is a phrase that I hear a lot, because doing good is in fact good for business. And so let that curiosity guide you. How is this good for your business? How will you working with me improve the, the efficiency, the effectiveness, the, the overall capital of whatever of this company? It's a mutual benefit. And the point being is you're trying to build a sense of mutuality and respect. If you've worked in development and fundraising for any period of time, you feel like you're always on the bottom. I'm always the person at the disadvantage. I'm always talking to the person who has, and I'm always, always trying to get them to give me what I don't have. It's important in the culture of philanthropy and fundraising for us to work towards mutuality and respect. And with, when we work with corporations and you're able to say, like, there's a mutual benefit here, it builds towards this this more collaborative approach 
between equals co-creating together, doing something that we couldn't do apart from one another. And that's a big thing to be able to say too. This company can accomplish the impact they want to have in the world without your nonprofit, right? Exxon just can't go do anything they want to. A local company can't just start doing things. They've got to do their business. So you are the conduit through which they get to experience impact. Use that to your advantage. Make a plan, work plan. This is like my motto. Make the plan, work the plan. Tell them what you're going to do and then do it. And then tell them what you're going to do again and then do that. And then keep doing that over and over and over and over again. Clear impact reporting. The backbone of any sustainable relationship is having a clear plan of how you're going to communicate the success of your organization and the metrics that these persons are looking for. Um, remember, the persons you're talking to at these companies probably are not specialists in your field. So like for me, my most recent experience in social stuff is with around housing and homelessness. As I didn't go to school for this. I was I became an expert because of just I worked in the field for a while. But like when I was talking to persons at companies and donors, they're not experts in this. So see yourself as that expert. You are bringing them along. You're educating them about impact. And so the best thing you can do is keep things simple. Um, well, let's talk about future funding real quick. Impact-driven evidence of success can lead to increased support. When I say make a plan, work the plan, if you say, I'm going to deliver you these impacts, and then you begin delivering those impact metrics, when you're clear about that, um, it's kind of like Pavlov's um, hierarchy of needs or that thing. Like, you know, if you keep like saying like, you give me money, I give you impact. You give me money, I give you impact. Set that relationship up. That's the simple aspect of it. They contribute you give them impact or you give them whatever they're wanting. Employee engagement, good stories, visibility in the community. It is like that. It is you give this, I give you this. You give this, I give you this. And not in the sense of that it's transactional and mindless, but that it gets into a space. And this is when I use those, those fluffy words. It gets into a space of faithfulness and trust. I do this, you get this. You do this, I get this. You're building a sense of when I act, you act, and it's trust. I know what's going to happen, um, especially in the space where people are like leaving their jobs for a new job. Getting to a space where there's trust and rhythm means you don't lose funding if the person that's your best buddy gets a new job. And then keep it simple. Identify the metric or the thing that the company wants the most and give them that. Do not spin your wheels on trying to offer metrics that they haven't asked for. Because again, they're not specialists. So if you're talking like homeless and housing, maybe the metric they're most, they most care about is I want to know how many persons got into stable housing. The metrics on, well, we have 45 people who joined our whatever workshop, or we have 27 people who got an ID this month. That's not the metric they asked for. The metric they're interested in is the metric on housing. You have other metrics, but this is the one they want. And so this is the one you should focus on. Meaningful engagement. Um, the most important thing here to know, and this is like a major pitfall I see with nonprofits. I alluded to this earlier. It is very easy to tell. You've been at a volunteer event. I've been at a volunteer event where you arrive there and the nonprofit is in no way ready for you. Or it's very nonchalant. They're like, yep, we got some boxes in the back. Go move them. I'll check on you in two hours. Good luck. All right. That's not the kind of engagement that wants me, has me feeling like I want to come back. You know, have you ever seen one of my favorite movies from back in the day was uh, that Will Ferrell um, racing movie. Um, and he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, that's the worst thing you can do for a volunteer. If they have a time, if they come to your organization to volunteer with you and there's ever a moment where like, I don't really know what I'm doing. That's not good. They can tell when the thing's thin. So like, if you are a part of this agreement is engaging with this corporation, work on what does it mean for it to be meaningful and know whatever it is, make it meaningful because people want to feel like they're part of the action. And when planning ways to engage, make sure that your participants get as close to the mission as possible. And let me quickly say this. This is entirely unique to your nonprofit. I said that I've worked in um, worked with persons experiencing homelessness. For me, that is a protected population of persons. When you volunteer working at the nonprofit, 
um, serving these persons. It's not like, hey, come on, volunteer, meet Bill. He's homeless. He's been on the streets for 25 years. He's experiencing addiction. You know, no, like, I'm not going to do that. That's not right for Bill. That's not right for my mission. That's not in any way aligned with my values and goals here. So I have to think creatively. I can't, I won't, you know, um, steal anyone's privacy or their story. So I've got to think creatively about how am I going to bring persons as close as possible to my mission with, without subverting my mission. And a lot of times I think nonprofits will do that, right? Like we've seen the videos on television where it's like, here's a starving baby in Africa. Will you send us some money? And I always think like that, that's a human person that we are using as an example of this. And they didn't necessarily agree to that. That's not okay. So think about that. Um, but that's the wonderful thing that opportunity you have as a nonprofit to think uniquely about how it is you're gonna bring people close. And I have seen some really wonderful and imaginative ways of bringing people in close to the mission. And know this, when you develop strategies that really engages their employees, you are really engaging the stakeholder base that companies are listening to the most. If their employees are coming back from a volunteer opportunity with your nonprofit or anything, an event, or they get a newsletter or a video or something, and they're telling their boss, their decision maker, oh man, that nonprofit's amazing. I just love the work they do. I love it when we volunteer with them. I love it when I get some of the newsletter saying my company is doing something with nonprofit. That employee is going to stick with that company. It's going to build a sense of fidelity within them. They're going to stick around. But also, you can get aligned for giving days. And I think this is where there's a lot of power in the corporate social responsibility space because giving days are the perfect opportunity for companies to contribute and to bring their teams together for collective impact. There's visibility. There's community participation. There's meaningful ways of engagement. You can make it fun. I've seen companies blow it out of the water with parties and happy hours, and fairs and things like that. And people get into it. And it's a wonderful way to build team and to build a sense of collective identity. And imagine what that might look like. You know, here we have Amplify Austin Day. We have over 70 companies that participate every year. And the really smart nonprofits are the ones that are looking at engagement year to year. They're going and looking and seeing who from ABC company has been giving to my nonprofit in the past three years. And then they're able to go to that company and say, hey, did you know they don't, we're not getting into donor privacy, but we're able to say like, hey, did you know that there are 25 people from your company that are contributing to us? It helps that company see where their values are, where the people that work for them, where their values are. Um, and so, like I said, many companies are going to seek to capitalize on this opportunity to engage their employees on giving days. And here's a really important thing. Oftentimes, employees are not exhausting their matching potential. As much as these companies are just like broadcasting it, you, each of you has $1,000. If you will just go and log your donation on this platform, we will quickly come behind it and double it. A lot of these employees just aren't doing it. They're not, they're not educated about it. So like, this is a great way for you to offer um, to these companies an avenue to engage their teams. And let me say this, here's another trick you can do long-term with these giving days, or really any giving, any time of giving, but giving days are great for it. Over time, you can identify within companies, individuals who are champions for your nonprofit. And I'm gonna tell you right now, do not forget this part. That is the secret sauce. If you find a volunteer from a company who is deeply passionate, who cares about what you're up to, that person, and I mean this in the most loving way possible, can become a thorn in the side of every single person in their company, always reminding them, no, 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 no. right now that nonprofit I love, they have that gala thing going on. Can we sponsor a table? You know? And, and a lot of times it's like these companies are like, yes, yes, we love when people get passionate. And when you say you found a place that you love, we really want to support you. Like that's your secret sauce. When I see nonprofits that are really doing great in company spaces, it's because they have identified somebody in the company who is a champion. And that person who's a champion knows how the philanthropy operations work within their company better than you do. And they can work that system better than you can. And so just get somebody on your team. 
within that company and they can leverage all those resources. And then last, my last practice for you. Nope, I have two more. Sorry about that. No, no, no. This is my last one. Six, trust word of mouth. Like, as you can tell, like, <laughs> I always tell people this, like, I'm a good time. I'm a great time. So like, I do well with word of mouth. And so like with donors, with corporations, like whenever I'm talking with them and they, I have this sense of that, like that corporation knows Jared is trustworthy. Jared's always going to give us the straight dope. He's always going to tell us what's up. He's going to deliver those metrics the way that we want them. He's always thinking about how to engage. He's doing this. He's doing this. He's doing this. Well, guess what? Those persons that work for companies have friends that work for other companies. And a lot of times they're networked up with people that do the same thing that they do within companies. There are CSR cohorts. I'm speaking at one on Friday with a CSR cohort of tech companies. And I got invited because one person I got to know. And they said, you got to meet these other people. So word of mouth is really important. If you can become a nonprofit and present yourself in your community as a nonprofit that is great to work with for corporations, man, their volunteer opportunities blow it out of the water. Gosh darn it, those impact reports they put together for us are simple, easy. I get to pass them on to my stakeholders. Holy crap, this nonprofit really invests in my employees. This nonprofit really does a great job of you know, shouting us out on social media, making sure that everybody knows how great we are, that reputation, that is where you get into exponential growth. That is one of the secrets too. People talk to one another and it is word of mouth. And what will begin to happen and what I am seeing in my own personal like work stuff is when word of mouth starts happening, that's when you start getting the emails out of the blue. Because people have heard They've heard about how good you are. They've seen the success and they'll start reaching out to you. And you will not be in that position of always having to chase after relationships. All right. I sped through that. I hope that you guys were able to download that all and kind of think through that stuff. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll save for questions later, but then I'll pass it on now to Annie. Yeah. All right. Well, I offer a different side of the coin in my perspective. I work with a lot of our corporate clients who put together the frameworks for their various CSR programs and who are ultimately deciding which programs they will and won't offer and the direction those are going in. So that's where I'm coming from here. Uh, so let's, oh, <laughs> I uh, made my PowerPoint big but didn't share my screen. Nice, okay. Here we are. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a few things that I think are high level. There's a lot we can get into. Like I'm sure Jared and I could talk your ear off together for like a full two hours because a lot of what he said resonated with me. Um, and one of the most uh, resonant things that I think he said was it's a business decision. Like it's really unfortunate because like I donate to nonprofits. I volunteer my time and I do it because I'm personally aligned with the nonprofits in which I care about. Um, and it's an emotional connection for me. But like these companies, like, yeah, they're people and they're people with emotional connections on an individual level. They often aren't the ones making the decision at the end of the day. And it ultimately comes down to multiple kinds of business factors. So it's just an unfortunate reality we have to deal in where he said everything really correctly. It's impact data, making sure you have a plan together, making sure it's measurable, doing what they asked for, like, and making sure you're meeting expectations in the way that you previously agreed upon. Like, it's a lot of that. Um, so this is from my experience, what I see that CSR teams are looking for. One thing that's not on here that I do want to call out really quickly is you have to remember, you might be working with Exxon. Exxon might have a one person CSR team they might not have a 20 person CSR team, despite being a gigantic company, they might not have a huge CSR team and one person might be doing a lot. So the best thing you can do is stay organized and make it as easy for them as possible. Because at the end of the day, that's an unfortunate matter is they're dealing with a lot of different kinds of CSR initiatives and you are maybe one of them out of like perhaps a hundred. It's just, it gets to be a lot for one person to manage. So that's just a good context to keep in mind. Anyway, I digress. So what are CSR, CSR teams looking for? The biggest thing is outcome data. 
they need data. They're asking you to share impact from what you have done so they can partially take credit for it. That is essentially what it is. They need to put out an annual CSR report, or most of them do, that is like, hey, this is the impact we did, LOL. It's actually you guys, but we're helping you get there, right? So that's kind of the goal. But they need that because it's part of their business strategy. It's part of marketing. It's part of PR. Sometimes even for them, it's part of their investment strategy. They get major investors to come in based on CSR strategies. CSR is becoming more of a table stakes thing now. So a lot of com most companies have a CSR group, but it's becoming increasingly business driven and less emotionally driven what we were going for. So the other thing you can do is, and again, repeating some of what Jared has already said with us, you want to make sure you have shared goals with them. He talked about it like the horizon point. Couldn't have said it better myself. You don't need to be 100% exactly aligned, but you need to have some one of your outputs, like one of your goals as an organization, whether it's building homes for the houseless, arranging housing, getting people IDs, whatever that might be. It needs to be aligned with one of the things they care about, which is what their business actually does. So like 3M probably really cares about getting school supplies to children because they make school supplies. For example, food companies care about providing food to people in like food deserts. That's something they care about. That's directly related to their business. They also care about the needs of their customers. So who are they serving? That's another angle you can take it from. What's their buyer? So like if we think about like retail markets like Kohl's, who's buying from Kohl's? Who are those customers? How How is what we do relating to that their customer base? And that's a little broad, but it's an angle you can go for. The other thing they really, really care about these days is people care about employee engagement, especially if like we do have, we see an increasingly remote workforce. It's not always true, but like what we see is that volunteerism, uh, giving to a cause they care about, working for a company that has values that are aligned with their own is really important to employee er, to their employee strategy. They're trying to attract and retain top talent. And not only are they trying to attract and retain top talent, they're trying to keep them excited to work for them. They want to, them to feel emotionally connected to their company. And you are a major part of that. So the opportunities you provide, whether it's through a grant program or um, through your actual volunteer opportunities, whatever that might be, it's helping the company share that impact story to their employees so that they feel more attached to the, the CSR initiatives. Um, and on that note, a lot of companies I'm working with right now um, are really hyper-focused on give where you live strategies. This is really hard for them to manage because if we think I brought back, we have Cheryl working in the CSR department of a 10,000 person company and she's doing a lot of work. It's too much work for Cheryl to manage. There's no way she can keep track of what are what nonprofits she should be paying attention to in San Antonio, in Minneapolis, in Los Angeles, in Spokane. She has no idea. She only knows where she lives. She's relying on other people to help her get this information. That can be one way where you come in, as um, Jared said, like, if you already have people that are giving and volunteering with you, that means more than likely they're probably local. And you could try to figure out what your avenue is to get into the company from there. But companies do care about that give where you live component. And then finally, legal requirements. So I, you guys probably already know this based on your particular um, cause that you're catering to, but different kinds of companies have different legal requirements for what they need to do is as CSR initiatives. This is not always true, but we think about the financial sector. Credit unions, hyper local, love financial education. They do have some requirements. It's minimal, but banks are like have to do a certain amount of activity in the areas they serve related specifically to low income individuals. And it has to be related to finances. So if you have those things and you know that, great, cool. That's a really good use case for you to go, hey, propose your services to a bank. Also, solid business case. You just, you're presenting a business case to them. It's just important to keep in mind that you're presenting it that way and not from like, yes, emotional parts do still matter, but like they need to know facts and figures. How are you measuring success? 
how will you provide us that data? Can you provide us that data? How are you collecting that data? And then if you're asking for time, to Jared's point, you want to make sure it's things that volunteers can easily engage with that don't require a long time commitment. I used to volunteer at hospice. I had to do a training. I had to commit to six months of it. That is not what we're talking about here. And then just as a rule of thumb, we see corporate clients. They don't want to do like a spray and pray method where they just fund a thousand different things. They want partnerships. So they're looking to find those nonprofits whose missions fit their mission that they can partner with long term because it's better for all of you. So, sorry. This is how our software can help enable you. So, if you're not using Vonterra, highly recommend there are some things you don't have to buy to use. I'm going to start with one of those. But um, so, one of the strategies you can take is ensuring your visibility in CSR platforms. There's major players out there. Some of them have externally facing portals you can just register for. Do it. Make sure you do it. Look up what those CSR platforms are. Register if you can. So what that is, is you're making it easy, again, back to that, for the corporations to get all of your information in the spot they're going to find it, which is usually their platform first. So they know that you're working with a bunch of different platforms. They unfortunately don't always have the time to care enough to make it easier for you. That's just an unfortunate reality. Um, but you can do that. You can make your profile, update your mission statement, your address information, um, population served, or whatever you're trying to do um, for the greater good of the universe. And then keep your details current. It just helps with them. This is something that can e easily be like overlooked, but it is important. Within our tool, we have something called Front Door. If you haven't heard of Front Door, go register for it. It's going to be the crux of the connection between nonprofits on our software and our corporate funders and foundation funders. So that is gonna be the avenue with which we match make between them. Different softwares will do different versions of that. I like to point it out because that's an easy to use and it allows you to put all of your information in there. This is just some screenshots of that to show you. You register, you pull your tax ID, center against it. You can be have multiple organizations within your account, control who at your nonprofit has access to your account to manage this relationship with corporations, confirm donations, confirm volunteer hours. Some corporations require that. The sooner you can do it, the better. It means the sooner you do it, the more you get paid. And you can also manage things like your payment information to make sure like, hey, we just switched from PNC to Bank of America. Cool, update that ASAP because that's gonna make sure you get your ACHs swiftly without any complications. So I'll go through that. So the next one is just honestly, just be prepared to provide data. So to Jared's points, like the, typically the way our clients are set up is they're looking for certain statistics that they want to pull into their CSR annual report. So that's kind of what they're, the lens they're looking at it from. They might not have chosen these. It might have been their board, their CEO, their PR, their marketing team. Like you never really know where the input's coming from but they have specific metrics. Often, in addition to these, they'll have a space where you can input whatever is unique to your organization, such as they're asking you how many people you got into stable housing, but you can also, there'll be another additional field for you to input um, non-specified information, such as number of people who um, obtained licenses or that sort of thing, uh, attended workshops, an attachment for your reports, whatever you want to include. They want digestible, relatable impact stats. So usually the reason they're asking in that certain format they're doing is because they're working with 20 nonprofits and all of that data needs to be standardized in some way to filter into their annual report. That is the reason it doesn't always make sense how they're asking it, but that's why it is that way. With their data, like the best thing you can do is show them something tangible that you do with each dollar or hour received because that's something they can tell their employees to get more engagement. It's something they can explain to leadership easily. You're just giving them a little bite-sized nugget to make it like a short story that they can easily spread back to that power of word of mouth. And to Jerry's point, you just want it ahead of time, you need to know what kind of data they want. Because if you're agreeing to work with them, if you're agreeing to accept money from them and they've agreed to send money to you, you want to make sure that the data points they're asking for are things you can collect and deliver on. And it, 
just makes your life a lot easier if you know that on the onset instead of, hey, we completed it. And they're like, cool, we need these stats. And you're like, what? Not great <laughs> for anyone. With volunteer opportunities, yes, you absolutely want to use your existing volunteer base. Talk to your volunteers, talk to your donors, figure out where they work, figure out if they can be the thorn in the side of the companies where they work. Because to use my example of Cheryl and CSR, she's one person, she's probably populating all of the volunteer events into her system herself. So if she doesn't know about it, it's never going to be there. So that's a really big thing is they don't just have databases of volunteer events. They're using a system where they have to populate the events in. And if they don't have nonprofit relationships or their employees don't, that's an empty database. There are no events for employees to sign up for. So if possible, you want to be able to post volunteer opportunities directly into the corporation system. Some systems allow for this. It's usually on a client by client basis. So like TD Bank might allow for it, but Disney might not, for example. It depends, but find out. You can always ask. And if you can do it, post as many as you can. Have someone go in there and update it monthly, quarterly, whatever it does. Just make it a regular practice. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's good. And then um, also with your employee or with your sorry, existing volunteers and donors, ask them to research what their company offers. You cannot know that. It's usually not advertised. You're going to need them to help you. They're usually happy to do so if they're already involved. You know they're passionate. They do care. They will find out. Because there's com they often, to Jared's point, like that person might be excited to volunteer with you, but they might not even realize that their company has that $1,000 match. Or they might not even realize if they volunteer 20 hours with you, they qualify for a $1,000 bonus to be awarded to your charity. They have no idea. So just showing you guys in our system, this is one way it can look to create a volunteer event that gets put to our client. But it allows you to submit all of the details and then the client can evaluate whether it's in line with what they want to post on their site and then they can. But they like this because it takes some of the work off them. I'm going to skip over this, but essentially what you guys need to take away from this is that our corporate clients really do want their employees to volunteer more because it has a lot of business outcomes for them that are positive. So finally, um, we talked about this already, but turning your supporters into ambassadors whenever possible. So ERG groups, to Jared's point, usually are really... Um, like foundational for creating volunteer opportunities, especially consistent volunteer opportunities. So that can be really helpful if you're aware of ERG groups at a company, um, or you can talk to, contact someone, find out if they're in an ERG group, that sort of thing. That's another place you can spread word of mouth. Um, some companies allow employee ambassadors because again, they want to enable give where you live or volunteer where you live but they don't live there, so they don't know what's going on. So they'll create like site-based, so geographic-based ambassadors. For example, Target is this way. And then can your supporters nominate you for an internal fundraiser or grant? Again, this all comes back to talk to your people, try to figure out what programs they have going on behind the curtain, because you're not going to know that, but they will. And some clients have really cool programs where like they allow their employees to nominate different nonprofits and provide a reason why that the company XYZ should give them money and then they evaluate it and grant you money. So you might just receive $2,000, $20,000 without having to apply for it. And that's just, I mean, that's really cool. They might not even be asking for impact stats from that, but they don't know about it. They don't know their employees care about it. So keep talking about it. Keep the dialogue going, form those relationships where you can. And that was all I had today. There's probably, again, a lot more we can talk about, but those were the few uh, heavy hitters I had prepped for y'all. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron, Annie, and thank you, Jared. I just combined your names. Congratulations. You now have a couple name. Um, I'm really thriving today. This is, <laughs> it's the middle of the week. 
Um, been been a long one, but I really appreciate both of you taking um, some extra time with us here today uh, and, and kind of giving some of these amazing insights, dropping wisdom, as I mentioned at the beginning. I think you you fulfilled on that promise that I set for everyone. So I uh, wanted to, to say a big thank you. Did want to take a couple of questions. Looks like we have, might have one time for one or two. Um, but I'll also launch just uh, a final poll here if folks are interested in exploring some of Bontero's tools um, in our fundraising and engagement space to make sure that you're collecting that correct data, right? Kind of have that easy access and you want to learn more about what you can be doing differently within your, your tech stack. Um, let us know. I'll leave that up there while we address some of the questions that came in through the Q&A. Um, Jared, I know you answered one I saw in, in the um, kind of typed out response to Reagan, but I'm wondering if you can maybe yeah. uh, give a quick synopsis of that one. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I love the question because you're going down a really great path. And this is a path that I think many of us don't consider. So the question from Reagan was a lot of CSRs now done through individuals, i.e. people rounding up on their total or adding a dollar to their final bill. Um, so like grocery store, do you want to round up to the next dollar to support, you know, ABC nonprofit or online? Would you like to add this to the thing? Um, the question ultimately is, is there a way to get this information from the corporation? Yes, technically, yes. But a lot of times what you're going to run into is privacy concerns. The company not willing to say, ah, you know, we don't really want to give you access to that. You know, we're collecting their emails and this, and we don't want to pass that around. Um, so what I've done with that is I have into the initial agreement, I ask the question, are you willing to share donor information with us? Most of the time, they're going to say no because of privacy concerns. And I'm already ready for that. So then the next thing is I develop a welcome map strategy. All I mean by, again, I keep things simple for myself. Welcome map strategy for means, me means is how can you create um, a pathway for that person to feel like they can take the step in. So is that some sort of a marketing material at the counter where the POS of sales happening? Or is it that you can get some sort of an automated email sent, again, not getting their email from the company, but an automated email that's sent saying, thank you, if you wanna learn more, click here, that kind of stuff. Can you create a welcome map where that person individual volunteers their information? Maybe that's signing up for your newsletter. That's a great welcome map move. If they've made that roundup at the you know the point of sale, get them to sign up for your newsletter so you can do the follow up. But yeah, great question. You just have to ask at the front. At the front, they're more than likely going to say no because of privacy issues. But you can still try to implement a welcome out strategy around it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for for giving that to the the full group, Jared. Really appreciate you taking the time to answer that one. Um, I know there were some questions that came in around front door uh, asking kind of where to go about finding it, if it's free of charge, uh, if it's only US or Canada. So I dropped a link in the chat to Front Door. I'll, I'll drop it in again. Um, and then we'll share that there's no added cost to join Front Door. And I know that um, right now it's just in the US. I don't think we have an ETA on it coming to Canada, but it will be announced publicly when it does. So you can keep an eye on that. Um, and I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. I think that's all there was to it. No, I think the important takeaway for Front Door specifically is that like with all of our products, we're constantly evaluating, reevaluating and like improving upon them. Um, so the goal is ultimately to expand it beyond the US, but we don't currently have a timeline for that. So I think just keep your eyes peeled. I'm sure it will be happening in the near future, but I can't say exactly what that time is. Cool. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions that have come in and we are about a minute or two over time. So uh, thank you for, for staying a few extra moments, both of you. Uh, thanks to the folks who, who joined us today. Hope you took a lot out of this conversation. Um, again, Jared and Annie can't thank you both enough for kind of bringing those two perspectives in and, and aligning them as well. And giving some really clear, actionable tips for, for the organizations who joined us here today. So I hope you all enjoyed it uh, as much as we did. So thank you again, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Thank, thank you, everyone. Much. Bye. Take care, folks.